Hello Animorphs fans and welcome back to the Animorphs universe. We're doing another analysis video and it's on a character called Lakova. And he's a Ketron, which looks like this. This creature here. Lakova is only seen in the Elamist Chronicles where he plays almost a secondary role. So let's do this analysis at the usual starting point, which is looking at what little information we're given about where he lives and his appearance and any other miscellaneous details. The normal introductory stuff, you know. I glanced at Asia level seven spa extension two down messenger 42, my closest up. He was a taciturn person, always had been. I tried many times to engage him in the games, but he was a serious scientist. One of those visionaries I mentioned. I thought of him as old 42, though I doubt he was much older than me. His chosen name was Lakover. He pronounced it lack of a. I think it was supposed to be droll. Jicklet grabbed Lakover's arm. Can you do this? I'll take your place. You're a biologist. I'm a tech. It's not a job for a biologist. Lakover is a scientist Ketron, a biologist specifically. Third level biologist, as we'll get into. But this is one of the only times where we actually have, a, a, we're shown how to pronounce the alien's name. We actually get a pronunciation aid for lack of a. Because when I introduced or, or talked about what I'm doing next time, I'm doing lack of a. I didn't know quite how to pronounce it, but obviously doing the research, I've seen that and I'm like, okay, it's definitely lack of a rather than Lakofa or something like that. So definitely, without a doubt, Lakova. Because it tells us, thank you very much, Buck. But we also got his full name there, which the Ketron full names are usually very long-winded. And so it's nice that we get shorter names and his chosen name. So this isn't a name he was given, this is a name he chose for himself. It is Lakova. Where does he live? Well, we know that he lives just up from Tumin, or who would later become the Elamist. And so all we need to do to find out where Lakova lives is to find out where Tumin lives. And we get that pretty early on. The age of my own home crystal, the Equatorial High Crystal, has been convincingly established as 1.4 million years. So there we go, he lives on the Equatorial High Crystal, next to Lakova, basically just up from him. Just a little bit up, he can shout, hey, Lakova, or should I say Lakofa? <laughs> That's not how you pronounce it, is it? Ha, ah, funny. Wasn't really. So, what, what, carrying on, what does he look like? We, uh, I'm not going to go over the general Ketron appearance because I'll save that for when I actually come to the Ketron an analysis. What's what distinguishes Lakova from other Ketrons? We do get. A couple of clues, mostly within the space of one paragraph, and this is it. Hey, Lakova, I called up, using my spoken voice rather than a Uninet mem. His head jerked, causing his rather long and artfully unkempt quills to quiver. He blinked unadorned eyes. He peered round at the sky, as though unsure where the sound could have come from. Finally, slowly, reluctantly, he lowered his magenta gaze to me. Tumin, what is it? He's got magenta eyes and his quills, which are like these bits here, are long, I suppose relative to other Ketrans and unkempt, artfully unkempt. So I don't know, picture, picture an 80s, like what, what sort of rock band is it? What Kiss, what, what sort of art is that? Get words right, Adam. That's it. Just have to look up Kiss. It's glam rock or glam metal. Yeah, that. So I can't believe I had to look up Kiss during this video. So Lakova's hair is artfully unkempt, and is that what glam rock hairstyles are like? Just look at Kiss, okay? Just do that. That's what he looks like. What about personality for Lakova here? Mostly we get glimpses of his personality as he's conversing with Tumin. So let's look at a few examples of how he reacts to Tumin and see what we can gather about his personality from that. I lost another game. 
Ah, well, I can certainly understand why you'd feel the need to inform me personally of a fact that, were I remotely interested, I could learn from the net. I wasn't put off by his attitude. Neither of us had ever requested a reassignment. That was proof of the fact that we got on well enough as neighbours. I waited, knowing his curiosity would get the better of him. All right, why did you lose? Redfire tells me I'm too much of an idealist. Hmm. I don't share the fascination with games, Lacoma said. Any game that can be played can be deconstructed. You can always deduce the laws, assuming you pay attention. And once you know the rules, that can show a victory. What's the interest? It's all software. Software is software is software. Boring. Hey, hey, Lacoma. He opened his eyes and favoured me with his usual disapproving scowl. What now? I made it. I'm non-essential. As non-essential as it's possible to be, he said dryly. So, very dry, very British. And though he's neighbour to Lacova, he, he comes across as very smug and sort of aloof to whatever goes on in Lacova's life. But like Toomin says, he never applied for reassignment. He has no interest in moving away, so... This is just his personality, but he actually doesn't mind Toomin. He just stays there regardless, so he's obviously got a soft spot for him. He's just very aloof to everything, and uh, he's like a Scrooge sort of character. But I'll tell you who's probably the best comparison. And I thought of this earlier today. Squidward. Squidward Tentacles from Spongebob Squarepants. He's Spongebob's neighbour. Who always, who actually is above Spongebob, so Spongebob will look up to him. And talk about games and all, all that sort of stuff, act like a complete child. And Squidward will, will, Squidward will look down at Spongebob, hmm, D disapprovingly and scowling, just like, basically acting like Lacover does here. Just sort of, sort of complete non-interest and looks down upon him like, fr freaking loser playing your games you should be doing grown up things like playing the clarinet or doing science stuff as Lacover does but then he never moves away and you see glimpses I'm remembering Spongebob I used to watch it all the, all the time as a child all the time it was like my favourite show Squidward always just show glimpses that he actually quite liked Spongebob and he did care for him on some level enough that no matter how much Spongebob annoyed him he never moved away he was happy to stay there as neighbour, despite the fact that he always hated it. And I get the feeling that's what Lacover's like. So Lacover is anim the animal's version of Squidward. And just like Squidward, he's not very quick to volunteer for things that seem dangerous. But in the end, he has got a bit of bravery about him. We need to see whether we can fly this thing, Lacover said. He licked his lips. He wasn't volunteering, neither was Jiklu. It wasn't hard to understand. An enclosed space was bad enough. An enclosed space occupied by a corpse was still worse. Dead bodies were not meant to be kept around. They fell away from their docks to burn up on the surface below. Anything else was hideous and perverted. I'll do it, I whispered. You don't have to, Lacova said kindly, but his eyes said different. If not you, gamer, then who? Lacova looked. No, no, no. Lacova looked for one drawn-out moment, like he might grab at the safety hammock she was offering, but he shook his head no, unable to speak, but signalling no. He would do this himself. He would endure what no Ketron could endure. So he's not going to volunteer for anything. He's not going to stick his hand up and say, "I'm going to do this thing." It's very reluctant. Like, nah, you do it. But he says it in a very kind sort of way. It's just like Squidward does, from what I remember from Spongebob. You know, he'll put on a nice smiley face to get someone else to do something. But then, push comes to shove, if he has to do it, he does it. He doesn't completely... I mean, that's probably where he's a bit different from Squidward. But what else can we get from him? There's a part in, in this where... They're aboard this thing called the MCQ-3, which we will get into. And there's this female Ketron called Aguella. 
and she spread her moans for Tumin, which is basically code word for, like, lifted her shirt up, <laughs> briefly. Be not concerned of her shyness, for it will pass. There you go. And Tumin thinks that, for just a moment, Lakava is falling for her, but just read the quote. You simply pull the tube extension from the collar, thus Lakava demonstrated. And you place it into your air hole, thus. Then breathe normally until the force field comes back up, or until you freeze to death, whichever comes first. What if we're not docked? Aguela asked. What if we're in one of the perches? There are emergency accesses there, Lakava said. Good question. You're thinking ahead. That made me open my eyes a bit. Was Lakava looking for some face face with Aguela? She wasn't moaning again, was she? No, I would notice that. I just thought it'd be interesting to have this little bit in there. So he acts kinder towards Aguela. Why? Tumin immediately thinks... He must like, you know, like her, <laughs> that sort of thing. But actually probably not. It's just that maybe he's more courteous towards females. Maybe he's uh, he's got that chivalrous side where he'll open a door for a lady, but then slam it in another bloke's face, you know, sod off, you know, like it was in the good old days. Days that I wasn't actually in, but I've been told they were good. And then finally, let's look at another aspect of his personality, and that is the personality that comes hand in hand with his role as a biologist. Lakava looked away from the controls and down to the dead alien. I was right. Probably Capazin, he said. Then he actually touched the head, turned it to one side, peered at it thoughtfully, and drew out a small instrument pouch. He was a biologist, an exobiologist for that matter. I guess touching dead aliens was easy for him. Probably even comforting. Again, this is just from lack of his perspective, not to say it's correct, it's objective. It's just from this particular character's perspective we're seeing things from. But he sees lack of a looking at this dead alien thing and thinking, oh, he's looking at, he's a biologist, specifically an exobiologist, which must mean that he he's comforted by dead things. Uh, <laughs> No, it's not necessarily true. I, I've done biology in the past, specifically zoology. And I've played with dead things. It is not comforting, not, it's not very comforting. So I've had my worst experience in regards to that was dissecting a pig's head. That was grim, not, not comforting at all. And I felt a bit sick after that. Second, dissecting a chicken in, uh, in, in Bangor University. To be fair, I did go for KFC after that. You know, it didn't put me off eating chicken. Still hasn't to this day, it's my favorite meat. It is the most versatile meat. I'm sure you'll agree with me. Something like beef, pff, be gone with you. I'm going for chicken. You can put it with anything. You know, people say there's not as much flavor to it, but that's the thing, you, you add other things to it. The texture is gorgeous and it does have its own flavor. And it's just, it's just the perfect meat, honestly. But that's what, that's what Tumin suspects, that he's comforted by dead bodies. It's, you can at least see that he has an interest in it. Like, oh, what's this thing here? The head goes there, body goes there. Hmm, how curious. So let's now look at plot. How is Lakava relevant to the plot? We've got his personality. We've got what little we have of his appearance, his location. Yada, yada, yada. He's a biologist. How is he relevant to this book, The Elemist Chronicles, and the series as a whole? Well, spoiler alert, it's basically only relevant to this book here, not the whole series. Well, actually, no, sort of is. We'll get to that at the end. But um, how does it start? So, Tumin plays games. Lakava is a scientist. They're neighbours. And it comes to the point where they've made this new spaceship on their crystal called the MCQ-3. And it's gonna go into zero space. It's the brand new spank, brand Spanker's new technology. And everyone's eager to get on board. They think, I, I wish I was important enough to be a central crew 
or even non-essential crew on this ship, this first voyage on this brand new Spanker's ship. And it's seeing lack of her, seeing how he looks down upon Tumin, that says to Tumin, have I wasted my time playing all these games? Well, first, I can't imagine why you would feel the need to fly all the way up to the perch when you know the results almost as quickly on the net. And anyway, I know I'm going. It took a few seconds for me to register that last statement, spoken as it was in a carefully offhand way. You're going? You mean, you're going as essential crew? Third biologist, he said, trying out a casual, dismissive wave of his mid-hands that didn't fool me for a second. There was no hiding that pink glow that began at the tips of his quills and spread toward his head. I was happy for lack of her. I really was. Except for the part of me that was screamingly jealous. I had a 1 in 500 chance of going aboard the Zero spaceship as non-essential. He had a guaranteed berth as essential crew. We were almost the same age, but somehow he had managed to accomplish a great deal more than I had. There's a wake-up mem, Tumin, I told myself. Can you read the time cue? I was an idiot. I was wasting my life in game playing, free flying and face face. Meanwhile, Lakava was on his way into deepest space to see firsthand the things I would see only later and only on some net sim. I fell silent. Lakava didn't seem to notice. Or maybe he just didn't care. It comes to the announcement of who's going to be non-essential crew on this MCQ-3 ship. And surprise, surprise, Tumin finds himself on it. And he's like, what do you know, Jon Snow? I'm on the MCQ-3. So he tiddly-taddles on, on, on his way back to the Equatorial High Crystal, wherever he births, and he speaks to Lakava. And it turns out that Lakava might have had something to do with his registration as non-essential crew. I'm on the MC. We'll be crewed together. I'm going. Oh, that. Yes, I know. How do you know? It can't be on the Uninet yet. There's a mandated quarter hour lag time for official announcements. Then I realized, hey, Lakava, how did you know? if it's just now coming on the net. No answer. You did it, I accused. You sponsored me. Why would I do that? He growled. Why would you do that? I echoed with a different emphasis. You don't even like me. I'm a gamer, a losing gamer. Why me? Lack of it didn't answer at first, but I guess he realized I wasn't gonna let him off the hook. He sighed again, grumbled inaudibly to himself for a moment, then sounded like a person who is being forced to confess to a crime, said, I have developed a morbid curiosity about your failures, Tumin. I'm a biologist, so I have access to your DNA map. You're in fact 194th in the rankings. Your loss earlier has bumped you 15 slots. Ouch. But in terms of pure analytical intelligence, you are very near the peak. I am? Yes. Don't play coy with me. You know you're smarter than gamers who beat you regularly. You lose games you should win. Not deliberately, but stubbornly. You're playing the game at a different level. Not trying to win. Trying to win with kindness. Altruism. I was embarrassed. Amazed that lack of had been paying attention to me at a level that I never suspected. We have a number of brilliant scientists, brilliant analysts, brilliant communicators, brilliant theoreticians, brilliant physicists, brilliant techs, and brilliant astronomers on board the MCQ-3. I asked myself what we didn't have, and the answer came to me. We had no brilliant losers. So yes, I sponsored you. Now please shut up, I have work to do. So, it turns out that Lakava, who Tumin thinks doesn't like him, sponsored him. Why? Because basically Lakava was curious. This guy loses all the time in his game, even though he shouldn't. And it's almost like he's doing it deliberately. There's a weird intelligence there, which makes sense to me. So somebody doing terrible all the time 
What if the reason they're doing terrible is because they're trying to figure out something new? They're experimenting. They're not just playing by the same usual rules. They're being intuitive. They're using their creativity to say, okay, maybe... Oh, you've changed colour. It's supposed to be white today. Stop it. So, I do these and I lose where I am. He's basically just being intuitive. And things about intuition, sometimes, eventually, it pays off in a big way. How are things invented? Well, it's not just by doing the same old thing. How does science work? Well, you don't just sit there and accept everything that science says. Think of... <laughs> Darwin, when he came up with the theory of evolution, didn't just sit back and said, well, science has said that, therefore I'm just going to do what science has already said. No, he said, I actually think they might be wrong. I'm going to go figure it out. And then changed the science. That's how it works. So if, if anyone ever tells you that the science is settled, just no. Science is never settled. Nothing in science is ever settled. The only thing that ever gets settled is mathematics, which is a level above science. And it goes in, all right, so at the top is maths, then it's physics, then chemistry, then biology, and then basically everything else. That's the, that's the levels of science. Maths, foundational, baseline. Everything after that comes into theoretical stuff, and theoretical stuff is never settled. If anyone ever says, science says this, therefore it's right, you, you punch them in the face with words, because they're wrong. And that's settled. <laughs> what I'm saying now, probably everybody settled and all. Right, another tangent. Let's just freaking get back to it. Basically, he was thinking like a genuine scientist. He saw that this guy wasn't satisfied with how things were being done and wanted to find new ways, wanted to explore. That's how, that's, that is a scientist. What I think of as a scientist is someone who isn't satisfied with the level of current knowledge who isn't satisfied by what we know and says, right, actually, we're going to find new knowledge. We're going to find out where we're wrong. That is a scientist. That's probably why lack of a sponsors him, because he saw that potential. So they both go on to the MCQ3 for a bit of an introduction thing. And because lack of a sponsored Toomin, he is his effectively his guide, his his tour guide on the MCQ3 and Aguela's there as well so they're having a chat talking about this thing and then while they're on the ship they start talking about the Capazins and this is where things get spicy the next day with the polar orbit high long gone from sight I went to board the MCQ3 for the first time Lakava as my sponsor was my tour guide Lakava's welcoming words to me were just try not to be a complete idiot, okay? That's all I ask. Lack of his eyes were hard. No, it's not in the Sims. And it won't be on the Unionet at all. You need to understand something. This isn't your old life. This trip is a little more than an innocent scientific excursion. And it's definitely not a game. His tone sent a shiver through me. Aguela and I exchanged significant looks. Every alien race we've encountered has been benign, Lakava said. But this race, the race that built this ghost ship, was not. The evidence is that they respond with extreme violence to even the slightest provocation. Extreme violence. They call themselves Capacins. Since the ship emerged from the direction of Quadrant 3, we assume the Capacin planet is there. The mission of the MCQ-3 is to contact this race and attempt to reach terms of peace. What if these captains are not interested in peace? Aguela asked. Lack of a smirk. Then we'll hope to get home with enough information to allow us to meet the challenge. One thing we know, the captains don't know we exist. If we meet them, we will keep our location strictly secret. Sometimes, he added thoughtfully. The things that seem to be problems are actually blessings in disguise. That last line there is again how I think Lakava feels about Toomin. Sometimes their problems are blessings in disguise. And that's probably how he sees Toomin, which is why he picked him. 
But regardless, there's that. He gives that. He is that stereotypical character in in films, right? So I can't think of any example off the top of my head, but I know for sure it's a trope. So you've got your main character who's all bubbly and fun and wahey, the lads. But then he's always got this mentor who's a lot older and a bit more stiff in the tooth, if that's the correct turn of phrase. But he's always a bit more aloof to everything and stern faced and he always gives he always tells that story that the bubbly guy doesn't know about and is meant to sort of intimidate or to say you don't know the real world that sort of talk that's what lack of his purpose is here and then he also gives the cliche line in any of these films like adventures or sci-fi or thriller there's that one line in the film which is basically when the character says it's getting real now and it's usually, it's, it's, some, it's always something like that. So it'll be something like, just making up a complete example. They never wanted peace. They just want war. It's that sort of line. In, in any film like that, there's always that one line where basically the character shoves it in your face. Right, this is the story now. This is where the change happens. This is the plot twist or, or where stuff gets real. These aren't chicken nuggets. They're asbestos. It's that sort of, you know, that turning, that, that dramatic line. That's what, <laughs> that's what lack of his job here is too. He's that guy. He's a full of all the cliches. He's Squidward, but loaded with tropes. And this is the line. This, I'm going to read it to you now, and this is the context for it. I could see the alien too well now. His lidless eyes were darkening, as if some deeper blue pigments were seeping into the iris. His head was bulbous, large by our standards. He had no wings. He had a beak for a mouth, a sharp, downturned thing that gave him a sad, disappointed expression. A number of long, thin, multiple jointed arms hung limp. His skin was a green so dark it might almost have been black. The long crystal spear entered his head from directly above. Kappa's in, Lackavus said in answer to my unspoken query. I guess our mission of peace is cancelled. The way they are now, where, where he says this tropey line, they're on this Kapazin ship. That, that They've killed the Kapazin inside and they've captured that ship. And this is the point where they understand that things are getting real and the Kapazins are coming for them. And they're going to take this little ship because it's got weapons on it, which the MCQ-3 from what I remember, doesn't have. So they need weapons. And so they also need pilots for this ship. And this is where two in volunteers. And then it turns out they need, somebody else needs to jump on there. And it turns out that Lakava is the guy to do it, reluctant as he is at first. I was not in touch, no mems, and no time for instructions beyond those passed on from Lakava. He shuttled to dock quickly explained what we'd learnt to Farsight, then raced back to instruct me. We're jumping back through Z-Space. We think from this short distance we can hit re-entry pretty accurately. The Wise One's orders are that you and I take control of this alien vessel and carry out any defensive actions possible. You and I? You mean, you understand we'd have to be sealed in? Yes, Lakava said flatly. Yes, Jiklet will seal us in. I felt sick at the thought, but not as sick as lack of her. He was oozing moans, fear. The smell of it triggered my own panic reflex, and I had to struggle to maintain my shaky control. Like you told me, lack of her, close your eyes, I said to him. Close your eyes, I'll help you down. He had nothing to say, no wise crack or wry observation. He was beyond that, and now I found that helping him with his fear helped me with my own. It's the wise ones that get him to go on board, and yeah, he's reluctant, but he does it. He steps up to the plate, even though he's basically trembling his way into doing so. And then his job on board this, while Toomin is on the weapons console and all that, he is in charge of piloting the ship. Although it is still... Toomin has given him the orders, so Toomin's effectively the captain. And... Uh, Jack Lacover is basically driving the ship. I fired. Missed. 
Take your time. Aim carefully, I said. Do what? Lackover cried, hands clutching, blue knuckled at the controls. Reverse thrust, now! And then, Tumin blows up the Capazin's ship, which Lackover is shocked by. This is not something that he or basically any Ketron has experienced. What are you doing? She's disabled, Lackover said. Careful aim this time. I fired and held the ring down. The Capazin ship blew apart, a thousand small fragments. Now she's disabled, I whispered. I glanced and saw Lackover's horrified stare. I couldn't share it. It wasn't coldness on my part. I just knew the game and he didn't. The Capitans could have fired again and killed us. They could have fired flechettes at the crystal. The only win is a kill, I said. That's the game. It's their game. They didn't disable the home crystal, they annihilated it. Their game, their rules. Lakava made no answer. We returned to the MCQ-3 and parked the crate within a flutter of the main perch. We had to confer with Farsight. I suggested Lakava go. No, no, Elemist, you. If I get out of this box, I'll never get back in. I can rest here, keep my eyes closed, or maybe look at this alien. You go. Besides, you're the gamer. And then, of course, everything goes a bit wibbly-wobbly. Two Capitan ships emerge from the clouds. I didn't wait for orders. I beat wing to the crate. I slid down through the hatch and barreled into Lakover. There, I panted. I saw them. 50% thrust. Reverse thrust, I said. Lakover didn't respond. It's the only move, Lakover. The crate. We have to save it. It's the only weapon we have. Our only chance. They'll kill everyone. Everyone, won't they? Every crystal one by one. Not us, I said harshly. Not if we run. Lack of it, we're it. We're all we have now. All of the Ketron race. Now reverse thrust. Do it. The Capitan ships didn't bother to pursue us, as the MC and we two in the crate blew towards space. High above our lost, doomed planet, we rendezvoused with the MC and were accepted back inside the force field. It was the end of Ket. And although there were still 72 Ketrans alive at that moment, it was also the end of my race. And that's the end of the first part of the Alamis Chronicles. So we're left with Lakava and Tumin on board the MCQ-3, making up a crew of 72 virgins. Ketrans. And then they're there for a long, long time. I need to sort my colour out. They're there for a long time. To the point where they actually have a new ship by the next time we come to meet them. They've been in all sorts of scuffles. And they're basically searching for a new home because Ket's been destroyed, their home planet. By the way, I've done a analysis on that. And I'll probably advertise at the end of the episode. Go watch that. Their planet's been destroyed. They're searching for a new one. But they've been very picky with what they're after. So they've been searching for a long, long time. Been in a lot of scuffles. And they've now got a new ship called the Explorer. The Explorer was a new ship whose design reflected lessons learned in previous encounters with alien craft. Lakava is still there. Tumin has basically been promoted. He's, he's basically he's in charge at this point. He is the wise one. But how does Lakava treat him? How do they treat each other? Let's have a look at this passage here. I flew down ship with Aguella close behind me. Lakava met us halfway to the Explorer. You're leaving Menno in charge, Elemist. Are you crazy? You'll turn the ship around and head back to his little utopia. Lakavus steadfastly refused to either treat me with the deference due to an official wise one, or the obedience due to a commander, or for that matter the basic respect due to any fellow Ketron. I valued him all the more. He had grown cranky over the years, crankier even than when he'd been a lowly third biologist. He was the ship's chief scientist. I have Deved watching him, and anyway, the crew is loyal, Lakava said. Don't count too much on loyalty, Elemist. It's a weak force. He was not merely being facetious. He was serious. Did he know something? I wanted to press him for information, but Lakava was trusted by every faction. He was trusted precisely because it was known that he would never violate a confidence or become an informer. And yet he was sending me a clear signal. Most likely, he was exaggerating most likely. 
So that's where Lacquer has come to over all the years. He still maintains the same basic relationship with Toomin, which I think is what keep. That's why Toomin likes him, and that's what he actually enjoys. He doesn't want Lacquer to suddenly be all, oh, Commander, what shall we do? He likes Lacquer the way he always was. It's almost like a reminder of home for him, how Lacquer treats him. And they both seem to thrive off of this. And we get a clue there that Lacquer is a pretty trustworthy sort which, you know, adds to his personality. Maybe that's changed, or maybe that's how he always was. But he's pretty much trusted all around, so you can rely on what he says. And then for him to turn around and say, are you sure you can trust these people? Tumen rightly thinks, hold on a minute. <laughs> what are, you try are you trying to imply something here? But then we never really get to see what happens then, because they all die. So we never get really an answer to the question of... <laughs> oh, and when I say they all die, uh, I mean all of them except for Tumin, which of course means Lakava dies. The monster slammed us head on. I was knocked off my dock. My talons were wrenched and bleeding. Aguela and Jiglet were still docked, but Lakava was down, out cold. Huge, a flash of monstrous mouth, wide enough to swallow the ship in a single bite. I floated, tethered, in a field of tentacles that spread as far as the eye could see. Menno floated nearby, tethered, penetrated, incorporated. His eyes were closed. His chest had burst open. I could see his insides. A few feet away, Aguela. My lovely Aguela. Tied, attached. A dead thing grafted onto the creature called Father. Lakova. Jiklet. Bodies, more and more. I twisted to see more and more. They were all around me, some seemingly uninjured, others torn apart by impact wounds or by sudden depressurization. Everywhere the dead, the last of the Ketran people. So how does Lakava die? Father, this big tentacle monster that we will address in a future analysis, takes the ship, kills all of the crew, except for Tumin who he uses to play games with. It's like a toy for the father, just this one Ketron. And all the other Ketrons, uh, they get attached to by these tentacle arms that are everywhere on this planet of father, including Lakova. Now we're not sure how precisely he died, but he did get knocked out cold as we saw in that uh, bit earlier. So you can only assume that he was knocked out by, by hitting his head on something in the ship and then he never woke up. We, I mean, that's what you hope, isn't it? You hope he didn't wake up to then die, you know, experience that death. So he got knocked out cold and then died either through depressurization or, or something else. It's not, we're not told specifically. But we know that his body is in enough of a single piece that he can be recognized quite easily. He is then just a puppet for father to talk through as seen here. I am father. Lakava said. He was gazing down at me from his dock above. Old 42. I am the life of this planet. All that is here comes through me, belongs to me, is a part of me. All power is mine. Father plays games with Tumin and all of his dead crewmates, including Lakava, become part of these games. They're still intertwined into Father. Everything about them is just absorbed, and Father plays dreams, using all these characters to Tumin. Again, Lakava is part of that, but he, but Tumin always wakes up to see that his friends and his crew members are still all around him, never at peace. Where Father had the body and brain, he could be far more creative. Aguela and I propagated. We had three juvies, but they were sad illusions, partial incomplete. I had never paid any attention to young juvies. My mind could not create them, write them fully. They seemed to come and go at random. I would remember them and they would appear. I would forget them and they would disappear for hours or days. Lakava and I grew old together, old friends. We spent our free time together, recited the old poems together, talks about the good old days. He grew old, so did I. 
I was back amidst the endless forest of tentacles, with Lacava and Menno and Port Aguella still floating, dead but never decaying, never disintegrating, never, never at peace. So it seems that everything about all of his crew members, all their memories, their thoughts, also get used like puppets by father. Which is why the kids that Tumin has with Aguela aren't complete, they aren't normal, because father doesn't have those actual people to delve into the memories of. And nor do the crew members, at least mostly, we can assume, they probably don't have kids, hence why they might have gone on this mission. We know that Lakava doesn't have kids because that was never mentioned, never brought up, so we can safely assume that he doesn't have kids. Nobody aboard really has a clue what kids are like, especially Lakava, so they're pretty poor illusions. But characters like Lakava, he, he had these illusions where he grew old with Lakava. Probably like this full lifetime illusion where Lakava was plugged into, even though he was dead, he was plugged into Father, so Father was able to make a pretty clear-cut illusion of him. But every time these illusions would end, Tumin would come straight back to the tentacle world and see it was just an illusion, they're all dead. A horrible cycle to be in, truly. But eventually, he figures out how Father works and using that intuition, that lack of a saw in him, that ability to think outside the game, to try new things, eventually he gains the upper hand and then he absorbs father. And with absorbing father, he also absorbs everybody else, lack of a included. I'm making you a part of me, Aguela. Do you understand? I'm downloading you, your thoughts, your knowledge, all that you were, are. I was always a part of you, and you were part of me. I lowered the barriers between us, felt the flood of information come into me. Data, that's all it was. The encoded data that, deciphered, was all that made her Ketrin. Her fear, her desire, her love. It all became a part of me. And even in that terrible moment, that hideous moment when I treated my one love like nothing more than a Uninet file, I gloated and thought, ah, father, you are a fool to withdraw. Now I'll come for you. I downloaded Jicklet, Lakova, Menno. One by one I absorbed their minds, the other Ketrans, till all the last of the Ketrans were inside me. So everything that was Lakova is now part of Tumin. What Tumin would become. And Tumin then obviously becomes the Elemist further down the line and he absorbs all sorts of creatures, all the things that Father absorbed, he now absorbs. And he goes and absorbs more and more and more. And then as the story proceeds, he gets more and more powerful and he eventually finds the Andalites, as we know, the primitive Andalites, and he sends down a clone of himself as an Andalite and he decides, how am I going to create this thing? I'm not going to put everything I know into this creature. I'm going to put aspects of certain people into this creature. The ones I treasure most. Because he's had this big fight with Kryk and now he just wants to get away and relax. So he's going to live on this planet as an Andalite. And these are the personalities he takes with him. I spent a year deciding what should and what should not be placed into the limited biological creature I'd cloned. It was a wonderful year. A year of learning. For what could be more deeply educational than poring over all you know and deciding what truly matters? In the end, what I placed inside the creature was me, Tumin, the Ketran gamer. I kept the child me. Strange, but all these years later, all these battles later, it was Tumin I valued most. I brought Aguela's memory, my one great love, and I carried Lakova with me too for his scepticism, his integrity, and his sense of humor. So Tumin, basically now the Elemist, he sees these aspects of Lakva's personality and he prizes them and he puts them into his own beloved clone, which he uses to live a life on the Andalite planet. Of course, that doesn't last forever. And eventually he goes on, falls into a black hole from what I remember, 
and then goes into the Thread universe, but he's still basically the same being, this conglomeration of all these different characters. But amongst those characters is none other than Squidward Tentacles here, Lacover. Effectively immortalized, dead but immortalized. Everything about him, his personality, his memory, everything is part of this Elmist being. And he carries on for eternity as far as we're concerned. So even though Lacover is dead, he's sort of eternal as well. Because what the Elmist can do is basically, he could put the actual Lacover somewhere. He could do that. <laughs> It would still sort of, no, it wouldn't necessarily be an illusion because he can actually put a physical being somewhere. And he has the actual real essence of Lacover, everything that made Lacover as part of his being. So, yeah, I think theoretically he could make the actual Lacover put him there. But of course, he, as far as we know, he doesn't. And as he did with that and light, he's more likely to create a new being, but with personality traits. So the and light himself, he mostly had two men, but he had aspects of Lacover thrown in there as well. So in a way, Lacover does live on in that regard. And then if you look at the Cassie Elmist conspiracy theory that I came up with, where I say that Cassie is a, an Elmist plant, maybe he used part of Lacover inside Cassie, assuming you agree with, if you think that happened, that the Elemist, just like he created that Andalite clone, made a creature based on certain personality types and planted her on planet Earth to go through this Yurk invasion thing, destined, predetermined to be in that. But that's a whole different story. Maybe Lakava is part of Cassie, if you believe that particular Annie theory. There's a video on that. Go watch it. I think, what's it called again? Cassie is an Elemist plant. It's something like that. So go look that up. It's, uh, I think it's well worth your time watching because it's an interesting one. <laughs> Very interesting. But that is Lacova. An interesting character. He didn't do much, but he was an integral part of what the Elemist became. And he was a fun character as well. Yeah, he was basically the Squidward tentacles of of the Animorphs, and uh, I treasure his part in it. So that's that. Not much else he do. In terms of affecting the rest of the series, like I said at the start of the video, yeah, he's only really relevant to the Elmist Chronicles, but then he becomes part of the Elmist, who is part of the whole series. But that's as far as it goes, really. Thank you, Lacover. You did certainly didn't lack in your, in your part in the whatever that joke's gone thank you very much for watching what's going to be the next analysis well it's going to be probably a very short one it is the other rachels because apparently there are four other rachels in the school and we're going to learn about them <laughs> that's the next analysis we're covering everything including the most obscure random stuff if it's a noun we're doing it if it's a person an individual even if they're just mentioned we're doing it okay so the next one we're doing the four other rachels that's the next analysis i hope to see you then if you're going to tune into that one <laughs> please do you don't have to if you don't want to it's not going to be an important one but just come for the banter thank you very much for watching i shall see you some other time somewhere in the animorphs universe ta -ra.